Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be back here at Leeds. I first came here in 2019 and taught this very facility next us. You were not the vice chancellor then, so I got here before you. <laughs> and, Le and Leeds is one of our foremost partners at the University of Pretoria. We have a large project on sustainable food systems. I see some colleagues in that project at the back of the room, funded by UCRI and includes two other African universities, the University of Nairobi and the University of Ghana, and an African policy network. And some of the values that you outlined there are typical in that collaboration. But I'm not here to talk about Leeds and us. I'm here to talk about a much larger topic which is embedded in that collaboration. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this noble and groundbreaking, indeed, urgently needed initiative to accelerate meaningful access to education for all. I'm truly excited about the daunting challenge ahead, as I firmly believe that without the deepening and broadening of access to and advancement of knowledge, we will not be able to respond to the big and grand challenges facing our humanity and our world today. We would not be able, for example, also to achieve the sustainable development goals. We exist and work in a complex, disrupted, uncertain, and globally connected landscape. The interesting thing about COVID-19 was that it showed our global connectedness by stopping everything and stopping everyone from the global north to the global south. Emphasize that we are globally connected, but we could be globally disconnected by something that looked as so small as a virus, but that spoke to all of the symptoms of how we have not lived in this planet the way we should. And in this uh, uh, disrupted context, we live with threats and opportunities across political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental domains and ecosystems. Not only are the challenges discrete within these ecosystems, there are multiple interfaces interdependencies and feedback loops between them. Shocks and dramatic changes to circumstances are frequent and inevitable, such that we no longer speak of a new normal, but are coming to understand a new unusual, which is in itself dynamic and uncertain. The manifestation and implications of our landscape dynamics are mirrored, and I'll only highlight a few. The political conflict and war that we see in Ukraine is front of mind, partly because it's in the news all of the time. But it is not isolated. There are multiple unresolved complaints around the globe that are not in the front of the cameras every day. It is a prominent example of conflict across a wide geographic and global footprint. We're seeking to resolve differences and pursue personal interests through violence, ranges from all possible phases of war to inter-community and interpersonal violence. Rising populism, corruption, misinformation, and disinformation are commonly associated with the rejection of science and facts. And this has been a large phenomena of life on the globe in the last five years, and even more. Where knowledge is valued, it is often ring-fenced through paywalls, pri paywalls, pricing, institutions of the few and not many, and are protected through nationalistic and competitive agendas. I think Simone referred to that. Democratic systems and global rule making are under severe stress, <laughs> and crises of global economic systems prevent just inclusive and sustainable development. The ubiquitous issues of poverty, inequality, and unemployment persist and often worsen. Technological shifts with digital transformation present a paradox of profound opportunities to influence models of education and access thereof. And we saw that during COVID, once the virus stopped us, we all allegedly went online. Not actually everyone went online. Only those with the means to go online went online. My university, because of historical circumstances, was one of those few that went online. But I was always conscious that my peers and my colleagues in the same system, in the same country, same society could not actually do so. Countered by unequal accesses, as I just said, in the, in the digital divide and associated costs of technology. As we pursue societal development, 
there's an increasing recognition of our planetary boundaries and resource scarcity. Our development impacts on environmental degradation and effects of climate change are already being felt. As many scientists have said, we are actually out of time. It is actually an existential crisis, and it's not certain that we'll be able, given the lateness of our actions and their lack of global coordination has contributed to. In this milieu of, complex, of complexity, higher education, its macroeconomic structures, inaccessibility, inequalities in resourcing, capabilities and access to knowledge are profound. Why universities are perfectly placed to create spaces for dialogue, where multiple voices can contribute to the understanding of the problems we face, and can also begin to create necessary, necessary solutions as a collective. As a collective, we are, at this time, not fully positioned to fulfill this role. At the same time, we ourselves are under threat. A crisis of public and other funding of public institutions takes place at a time where societal stakeholders are increasingly questioning the exclusivity of their universities. So you find a lot of private providers and others saying, micro-credentials are better. We can provide you with instant online courses better than a university with these fancy theories, and you will be job ready on day one. And, and so our, if you like, our institutionalized, what some people, monopoly on higher education is under question. They are, and also we are, considered, we are perceived to be dislocated and alienated from societal needs and our, and, and our contributions to advancing society, sustainable futures are also under the spotlight. As we look to face these challenges, our harsh reality is that we do not have the luxury of time. We may speak of a commitment towards 2030, but we are already immersed in a storm that will not abate. It's important that we, when we think of the future, we remember Neil Labode's famous words, the future is now. It's time to grow up and be strong. Tomorrow may well be too late. And similarly, we keep in mind the words of Chief Albert Lutuli, the first Nobel Peace Prize laureate from the African continent. In fact, the first Nobel laureate from the African continent, not just the Peace Prize. And he said, the test is action. Theorizing interminably, procrastinating or limiting access to knowledge are not options. So as we introspect and chart our path forward, the time for action is now. And while our actions must be considered and inclusive, they must also be swift. They must be accompanied by a preparedness to champion a cause of which we and the world we share depends on transformational and intentional leadership is the call of the hour. A good starting point is to reimagine the role of a and, and the role of and repositioning universities in relation to society. As institutions of higher learning, we exist because of society. And it follows that we should be functioning for the good of society. This calls for us to ensure and increase our relevance and efforts towards greater societal impact characterized by inclusivity, inclusivity and clear contributions to just, inclusive, and sustainable development. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, represented by this nicely colorful badge, the SDGs, through their collaborative design and aspirational outlook, and I think Simone showed the collaborative design, the Goal 17 Partnership for the Goals, and their aspirations, no poverty, for example, is something most people who are no, do not have faith in your human agency. We say it's not possible. Just do some amelioration of poverty. But the, actually, the sustainable government says no poverty, and it is possible. Provide us with a good and acceptable <coughs> framework to shape our actions in ways that are relevant to society. The question is not whether we will achieve it. It's what we do to achieve them. In this reimagined role, we are institutions for the public good going beyond the question in the formulation of uh, my good friend Chris Brink, who was vice chancellor of Newcastle. He wrote, the book, the, uh, he wrote the book, The Soul of a University, When Excellence is Not Enough. And so Chris poses this question I like to use very much. The question really for uh, us as our educations is not what we are good at, which is what 
in the computative frame you refer to, we post about, I'm the best professor in physics. I'm the best in so and so. My Google index, my citation scores are. That is all very good, <laughs> very good and nice. In Jokila most, but seriously, I often say to my colleagues at the university, don't tell me about what I'm already paying you for. You must be good at what you do. The question really is, what are we good for? Which is, if you like, an external question about our relevance to society. What is needed in higher education are universities that embrace excellence and twin it with relevance and impact, pursuing, and also, in other words, pursuing fundamental knowledge as well as challenge-led research, otherwise known as applied research. We leverage our strengths and capabilities to demonstrate responsiveness to the context in which we are embedded. And as a collective, we value and embrace collaboration as a partnership of equals. Overall, we restore trust in higher education and research, strengthening the pact between universities, the state, business, and civil society. Such a proposition is not philanthropic, nor is it nice to have. I believe that competition between and across universities must change at a rapid place, space, with increasing expectations for universities to move closer to and intentionally demonstrate societal relevance. The wicked and great challenges, the wicked and grand challenges facing humanity will compel universities to shift from solely generating knowledge to translating that knowledge into solutions that matter and make a difference. That is why open knowledge systems matter. This cannot be done by the traditional silo-driven university in isolation. Institutional and organizational innovation is needed rather than just focusing on efficient management of dwindling resources and increasingly managerial systems or pandering to those demanding more training and less of democracy inducing education. There is no democracy without higher education institutions. And you cannot get citizens trained for life that have a deficit of a democracy inducing education. It is in this regard, the new university will be involved in a double act of transformation, transforming itself as an institution, because one of the things we have to agree to is that Universities are not perfect institutions. They also have their own fractures, fissures, and left unaddressed, open up for attack from within and from without. So a double act of transformation, transforming itself at the same time as transforming society. Without the double act, the university's credibility and legitimacy as a transformative actor will be questioned, and its impact planted. Diversity, inclusion, and equity are therefore critically important institutionally as they are societal. It's not an either or. Indeed, the university of the future will be one that is in touch with societal needs and has mastered the ability to collaborate within itself and across its boundaries. To be a university that is defined by its broad, inclusive, and futuristic outlook, being connected to peers and other stakeholders alike for mutual benefit and mutual em empowerment in the interest of the public good. Inspired and aspiring to be in concert with others to be drivers and agents of change. This next generation university will be futures literate, able to uh, suspend existing mental models and paradigms of the present in order to envisage the future. And I think that this is the, the, if you like, the most exciting space we should be. I, I find that, that um, both COVID and prior disruptions, if you like, prior and existing pandemics, I think placed us in the place where we can begin as universities ought to do to dream. So able to suspend these models and paradigms of the present in order to envisage a future in, in different and unconstrained ways. Step change relevant and truly innovative solutions will flow from the tapping and use, utilization of in multiplicative ways and with multiple streams of value. The reimagined university within a value network of peers and stakeholders functions as a system and a set of interrelated systems. And I think that design thinking and systems thinking is very, very relevant in this regard. If you do not do that, you miss the structural elements, but also you miss the 
if you like, how that structure like, transforms into lived everyday realities. A key source of leverage is through advancing the practice of transdisciplinarity, which in its true and full meaning must include engaged scholarship. It is not scholar, it is not what we are good at internally and the internal competitions and, and the dreaded drinking systems but it is rather how we position ourselves in relation to the grand challenges. It involves the ability to collaborate across different disciplines, fields of knowledge and sectors, and around real and, and complex problems with the intent to find and co-create meaningful societal solutions that change the lives and life chances of the most in need. I think here I would like to emphasize the notion of co-creation, which I must move away from the notion of knowledge, the industrial metaphor of knowledge production into a new notion of knowledge co-creation between those with the certificated qualifications and, and the, the titles and the ranks with those that appear not to have knowledge but have a lived reality and everyday knowledge that we need to access. No longer being research subjects but also being our partners in research. This means embracing and valuing all forms of of, of course, validated knowledge and expertise, but also that knowledge that is not validated through our systems, which themselves need a disruption. From the embedded knowledge of street experts, the formal celebrated and peer-reviewed experts that we know. In this setting, two fundamental dimensions are important. The nature of relationships and engagement on the one hand, and the nature of knowledge and solutions on the other. Engagement with relationships may be underpinned by either low or high levels of trust. Knowledge and solutions may be protected or may be open and accessible. Where there are low levels of trust and knowledge is protected, we find ourselves in a transactional space characterized by silos, personal interests, which may at times be dysfunctional and a situation of winners and losers. That is the publish and perish culture and that kind which generates uh, different forms of bullying uh, and also things that actually do not engender social justice. This model is unlikely to adequately address the complex challenges faced by the world and humanity. Rather, we should seek to be in a transformational space of engaged responsiveness, characterized by high levels of trust with open and innovating sharing of knowledge that is translated into solutions which make a difference in a truly accelerated way. In moving from transactional silos to engage responsiveness, we intentionally drive a two-pronged approach, the way in which we nurture and strengthen trust-based relationships and how we generate and use knowledge. Trust-based relationships are underpinned by a shared understanding and common purpose across a raft of stakeholders who all have an interest in the challenge at hand. A common commitment to co-designing and co-creating solutions for the public good is also shared. Embedded within this new paradigm is a complex case for open data, open science, and open education. Fast eye sharing of knowledge, mutual valuing of different sources of knowledge and talent, and building broad-based and even capability to address challenges and capitalize on opportunities. All work towards dramatically, you call for radical transformation, accelerating the efforts to create a better world and a better future for those still to come. Clearly, there are barriers to the aspirational imperative. The unevenness and imbalances within global education ecosystems, such as the vast disparities between the global north and the global south inevitably create a powerful resistance and inertia to change. Let me just say here is that my notion of the global south and the global north is not just geographic. It is also conceptual because within the global north you find what is geographically associated with the global south. So inequalities, inequities are global in nature. Although of course the vast disparity is often seen geographically as the global north and the global south. The status quo never embraces change easily. With prevailing power imbalances, those who have remained content in their comfort, while the voice of the dis disadvantaged holds little sway and is easily dismissed. So you, you don't have to go any further than open television and watch the drama in Egypt 
and, and, and the discourse is there that to, to actually see a demonstration of this point. Current paradigms of computativeness and computation may be reinforced by the plethora of university ranking systems in our midst, with which we are compelled to play. A siloed and anti-collaborative culture in higher education is embedded and disrupting the cycle is all the more difficult. Now, the rankings are a very interesting institution because they are very much like the publishing industry. Here are people who claim to know what you are good at and then produce it into a Premier League football style uh, presentation to the public as what they should actually pay attention to. But they know nothing of how people are peer reviewed and all of that. But actually, they are now the expert. And if you like, they endorse what you are supposedly. And also, it's only supposedly what you are good at. Of course, the rankings are not as smart. Like capitalism, they know how to adapt to the environment. So both THE and QS now have impact rankings and sustainability rankings. But again, they don't know what they are exactly talking about. As we critically reflect on ourselves, and we also recognize that we have evolved from a system that drives specialization to the highest degree uh, and to the highest degree. While this is necessary to push the frontiers of disciplinary knowledge, we have to work, we have work to do in retaining disciplinary excellence while transcending a limited disciplinary focus to connecting and collaborating across diverse fields of knowledge and interest. Only then will we be able to drive meaningful change and shift, and shift societal dynamics in fundamental and sustainable ways. Furthermore, the ways in which we measure success and impact and the basket of metrics we measure ourselves are not the best way to critically assess the societal impact we should have. At best, indicators such as research outputs and productivity, the quality of the journals we publish in, which are captured because actually they do not belong to us, although they trade in something that is co-produced by ourselves, and the number of citations we describe our impact within a closed academic ecosystem. And you all know here how an invidious culture has been created by those kinds of metrics, uh, uh, creating the, the, the survival of the fittest uh, notion. There should be a means to an end, not an end in themselves. In isolation, there are weak surrogates for the impact we should be demonstrating at macro societal levels, such as addressing poverty and inequality. And these micro societal levels where we enhance the lives of people and the communities they live in. So what is a possible strategic approach to navigating dynamics and addressing barriers and capitalizing on opportunities? In developing strategies to shift towards the next generation invest that embraces collaboration and openness, our challenge is to craft a new approach that addresses a range of ecosystems, political, legal, economic, social, and biophysical, in, in a way that builds ecosystem resilience and gives expression to the meaningful existence of people and humanity at large. In taking up the challenge, I believe that there are certain prerequisites and pathways to impact. At the outset, we must demonstrate intentional transformational leadership. It's not enough to say we are transformational leaders. The nature of academia often has been to refer things and to address things by implication and nuance. I'm afraid that to change the situation, you actually have to be much less nuanced. That, that does not mean not being evidence-based, but to actually be intentional and transformation in ways that people can hold you accountable to the transformation that you actually promised. As individuals and as a collective across higher education, transformational leadership that is in touch with society and resolute in addressing our basic humanity and building our human potential for improved human existence. Such leaders are mindful of our planetary boundaries and embrace coexistence with all forms of life. In my view, I think, I think that's one way in which one should understand the SDGs. They are really about our basic humanity, its potential, and also being mindful of the planetary resources that we live. Having demonstrated in visible and felt leadership, we must capitalize on the wave of societal expectation for universities to play a critical role in securing a just, sustainable future for our world. This can serve as a powerful tailwind to shift dynamics in global education ecosystems 
Through these shifts, we are more able to influence the shaping and resilience of related political, legal, economic, social, and biophysical ecosystems. This change can clearly not be brought by individual leaders and universities acting independently and in isolation and in competition. We need to establish and strengthen a coalition of the willing as active drivers and capitalists of change. Through progressively increasing the size and influence of this pool, we are likely to reach a critical mass and tipping point that creates a new set of paradigms and standards for higher education, which are much needed. Such change must advance a transdisciplinary and collaborative agenda, which embeds literacy and is anchored on transdisciplinary excellence. Our collaborative effort must also connect macro system renewal to positive impacts on the ground, all the way to individuals and, and, and communities. Within collaborative efforts, it is essential to strengthen and mutually empower our institutions, as well as those of our collaborators and partners. And it's a vitally important value. That is why in my practice as vice chancellor and principal, I believe in the collaborations, because through the collaborations and partnerships, there's a lot of learnings that can happen and strengthening of each other. It's an ethics we should all embrace. This entail is building a new paradigm of partnership and collaborations that are not just bilateral, but multilateral and transcend current global and South disparities. So in my strategic plan for the university, I call the plan the African Global University. Part of it is just being cheeky, because that is nature of who I am, but cheeky for a purpose. Because the idea of an African university being global is unthinkable in the current configuration of things. But it is not impossible if we think differently, if you like. And also, we're a South African university, but pretend to be too much South African. We want really to be an African university, but we're part of the global academy and the global community of, of universities. Equity, mutual benefit, and mutual empowerment should be at the center of these relationships. A wide range of collaboration is possible across teaching, learning, research, engagement, and outreach. Key aspects include pursuing decolonial modes of teaching and research, multimodal mobility, global classrooms, and bringing both education and research towards intentionally addressing social and environmental justice as pathways to sustainability. So what we must also stop is the one-way <coughs> mobility of scholars and students from the global north to the global south where, in a sense, it's like a academic tourism, but without actually a, a, a flow of you know, scholars and academics rooted in their context, not just migrating into the global north, and then create a circulation and break the cycle of global north and actually rather have a global, if you like, public square of the academic institutions. Within these new paradigms, all forms of knowledge must be accessible and translated into real change. Accelerated innovation and positive experience. We should learn from each other, rapidly adopting and adapting learnings to different contexts. This new approach is an emerging space. And at the University of Pretoria, we are exploring how this might work at an initiative level. It includes mobilizing diverse stakeholders from different constituencies around a particular issue sharing different perspectives, and developing a common understanding of the problem with these related issues, and co-designing implement solutions for implementation. That is why, with our collaboration with Leeds, we embedded a policy network that works across the whole African continent, right from the beginning as part of the design. We should move away as academic institutions if we are to achieve this. From we will do the research with solutions fit for society, and we'll give them over to you. It should actually be done as an embedded practice, if you like. It, of course, one does not mean that in everything. A basket of qualitative and quantitative success indicators need to be identified across social, economic, and environmental dimensions, demonstrating impact with new and relevant sets of metrics as seen by ecosystem renewal and through eyes of partners, recipients, and society at large, which includes structuring a series of focus group conversations, will create a virtuous cycle of change, learning, and impact. Coming to the end, I believe that the Knowledge Equity Network and its partners will play a pioneering role in shifting global education 
ecosystem dynamics, bringing the knowledge and capability divide across institutions and geopolitical boundaries. As for the investor of Pretoria, we will continue to play an active role across a number of fronts, strengthening our raft of collaborations and partnerships, continuously looking to create new forms of value, these including hosting of South Africa's Sustainable Development Solutions Network, as well as an upcoming Africa Week. So allow me an advert uh, space next year in, in May, which is Africa Month in South Africa. From the 22nd to the 26th of May, 25th of May is Africa Day. We'll hold a, a, a conference called Open Science, Open Africa, if you like. And we're inviting all of our global collaborators. In large part, our success will be determined by the extent to which we contribute to the success of others. In conclusion, colleagues, partners, and friends, we have a mammoth task ahead and one note for the faint-hearted. It is however, a purpose-driven call to collaboration and partnering that will unleash the talents and ideas of all our institutions. We are surely up to the challenge. Nevertheless, we do not really have a choice. Our relevance depends on our success. It's just the future of our world and its people. Thank you.